Hi guys, welcome to the video and welcome to this beastie here. This is the Bell 407 which is by Dreamfall Creations for X-Plane 11 and it's going to be the tool that we use for this video. Now I do apologise, I haven't made a video in a little while. Uh, life unfortunately gets in the way of a lot of things like that um, but I'm hoping to try and get back into doing some videos for you guys again. Now the subject matter that we're going to look at is uh, how to fly helicopters in flight sims and it's going to be a very basic intro. Uh, two reasons for that. First one is so that this doesn't run into a 9 or 10 hour epic. The second thing is because they are incredibly complicated machines. Now in terms of my background, I'll just quickly go through my background. I am not a qualified helicopter pilot, be it uh, CPL or even PPL level. Um, I did an awful lot of flying in helicopters when I was in the military uh, however that was a rear seat crew so I didn't get direct stick time. What I did get however was the occasional jolly. So I had to play it flying around uh, in a Sea King, having a go at controlling that, uh, Lynx, Gazelle and a couple of other bits and bobs. I did do a few lessons as a in a civilian uh, capacity so I did uh, some lessons in a Robinson R22 which is twitchy as heck, uh, a Schweizer 300 uh, which is less so, but uh, they, it did give me a very good inkling as to what uh, flying a helicopter in the real world is like. So, that's the caveat. By no means am I an expert in this field. There are many experts out there, and there's quite a few of them on YouTube uh, who are exceptional at doing this. I'll also put a link into uh, a website uh, called Helisimmer, uh, which has a lot of good useful information. Uh, now. I'm not going to go into too many details about the highly technical aspects. Helicopters are horrendously complicated in terms of aerodynamics if you compare it to your average Cessna 152, 172 or even an airliner. Because they are dynamically unstable and there are a lot of issues with helicopters that you do not get with other aircraft. However, those issues then give you tremendous flexibility in terms of the ability to hover, to manoeuvre, work in confined spaces, load lift, etc. Uh, so they're e exceptionally enjoyable tools to learn to fly. Talking of which, there's a couple of questions that uh, potentially could be raised at this point. The first one is the choice of simulator and the second one is the choice of aircraft. Uh, in terms of simulator, uh, for helicopters, FSX and P3D in their raw state are not great. However, there is a package called Helicopter Total Realism, which I've never used and therefore can't comment greatly on. But as I understand it, it introduces a lot of the aerodynamic influences that are missing from the core FSX and P3D uh, flight modelling. So, as I say, I can't comment on it, therefore I can't give any comparisons. I do tend to use X-Plane 11 because it has uh, relatively good flight modelling. Uh, not all helicopters are, by any means of the imagination, perfect, uh, but this is one of the better ones for me. This is, a, as I say, the Bell 407 from Dreamfoil. Now, the other sim that's notable for helicopters particularly uh, that I'm aware of is DCS. DCS has four helicopters, including a Huey uh, and you know a Gazelle and whatnot. Uh, the flight modelling in that is very, very good. Um, Obviously the caveat with that is the flight modelling, unless you've flown a Huey, you can only get, give it sort of a, a considered opinion, uh, unless you've flown a real world Huey. And therefore we're in the, the lap of the developers for making sure that it is as realistic as it can be, and obviously they look for feedback from real world pilots etc. Um, so with that, for personally I find the uh, Huey is quite a challenge and the Gazelle just wants to kill me. However, that is another alternative sim. And finally, the one I've not really tried out, which is out there, uh, has uh, just had the Robinson R22 added, it is the Aerofly FS2, or uh, the FS2 version of the R22. Now, I haven't flown that, so I can't comment on it. Um, I'm going to have to come back to what I know and what I do know. And uh, For years I flew helicopters in FSX, um, despite the shortcomings in the flight modelling, um, however, I, I, as I say, I never went into uh, HTR, Helicopter Total Realism. So, my tool of choice, my weapon of choice becomes X-Plane 11, I did fly helicopters in X-Plane 10, and this beastie here, the Bell 407 by Dreamfall Creations. Now, in addition to this, there are quite a few community projects out there, 
Uh, there's a Freeware Bell 429, I think it is, for example, and uh, there's a MD500 and, and quite a lot of stuff out there for this. Um, so it's a very good sim and we're going to use a couple of uh, very cool tools to demonstrate a few of the things. Now this is not going to go in depth, as I say, into the flight dynamics in terms of uh, aeronautical engineering, but there are a few things that we need to consider. Now the first thing we need to consider is where we're flying. The whole point of helicopters is we can get into interesting places, so for this video I've got such an interesting place and it's by this company here, Prop Strike Studios. They do some lovely inexpensive scenery um, and this is it here so you've got Allen Burrows which is where we are at the moment Allen Burrows Island Machmel, uh, Machmel Fisheries don't know how to pronounce it which is free I mean this is only five Canadian dollars and then you've got uh, Quantum River Airport uh, again very reasonably priced and just to pop into these you can see the level of detail we'll see it as we're flying around but in terms of the images and the package as a whole very very nice this is where we are at the moment, we're tucked about here, just ready to go. You can see the quality of the, the visuals is uh, epic. And one of the things for me is helicopters allow you to find lovely little bits of scenery like this where you can uh, mess around. And for me, helicopters are all about just having pure fun. Uh, they're not really designed for long distance flights from A to B using lots of automated stuff. They're all about challenging yourself to get into small spaces or uh, interesting areas such as uh, rooftop landing pads that kind of thing so the thing I'm going to mention now is about performance uh, in terms of computer and for me what I prefer um, and I've actually recently upgraded my graphics card I've now got a, a RTX 2070 Super which is uh, actually very very good although quite pricey but nowhere near the, the top extremes that some of the cards go to and it's kind of fundamental to one of the key elements for me in terms of flying uh, helicopters, particularly if you're looking at VR. Now, I'm not going to do this in VR. I do have VR, but um, at the moment I'm not quite up to speed with it, so I'm not going to go into that realm. But in terms of uh, the actual helicopter, one of the things you need to try and do is, because they are incredibly sensitive to your hand movements and to movement in general, compared to, say, an airliner, um, they have no dynamic stability. Airliners and general aviation aircraft have a level of dynamic stability where if you displace it or if you uh, disturb it from a steady state it will tend to revert to that steady state and what I'm thinking of here is if you have uh, a wings level flight going on and something disturbs it so it rolls you slightly to the left in a fixed wing aircraft you will generally in most aircraft have, have some sort of uh, restoring balance to the aircraft where it will try and restore itself back to level flight. Um, and that can be seen by the thing that things like uh, if you're in a 152, something I did quite re uh, quite a, a lot of was if you're reading a map, you'd be able to take your hands off the yoke and then you'd be able to steer with the rudder pedals uh, just to keep yourself whilst you're faffing around with your map, for example, or getting something sorted. So there's a lot of inherent stability in a lot of fixed-wing aircraft. That is not present in helicopters. In rotary-wing craft, uh, most of them particularly if you don't have any stability augmentation systems in place, are dynamically unstable. So a lot of them have stability augmentation, be it through hydraulics or electrical, electrical systems, that will help you uh, control the aircraft with a certain degree of stability. Fundamentally, these things don't want to stay in the air upright. They want to try and throw themselves at the ground with some sort of uh, greater plomb. To which point we need to be able to control them, and we need to be able to control them with a great deal of finesse, uh, helicopters in real life are quite often flown just using fingertips. Uh, that's all we really want because we want to get the feedback, the tactile feedback, but also we need to uh, be able to demonstrate that we can control it with a, you know, a, a very light touch. We, we shouldn't be fighting these things. And to that extent, we also shouldn't be fighting them on our desktop. So when we have a desktop joystick, the last thing we want is to be fighting against a massive spring force. Now if you uh, hunt around on the internet you'll find there's a lot of people who fly helicopters on the internet, on the simulation world, who actually remove all of the springs. Um, and they remove all of the springs so that they can have a really light tactile feel on the, uh, on the controls. In my opinion not necessarily the greatest things, because then you can't let go of the controls at all. It, you, they'll just flop to one side and you'll crash and burn into the ground. Um, so for me, I tend to prefer something where I've got a light touch or a light feel on the controls and, where possible, a high degree of fidelity, a high degree of accuracy in terms of 
um, where the position is. So I don't want, uh, you know, small steps or, or lumps or bumps in the movement of the stick. I want it to be relatively smooth and there's a number of things you can do. Now, obviously at this point you then get into the controls in terms of what controls you have or want. I'll just pop up here and I'll show you what I've got. Joystick, right. I have the Thrustmaster Warthog set up. Uh, so I have the joystick, but what I have is I have an extension which you can get from this sort of company. Um, they do extensions that basically just screw into the base and then you screw the handle on and they come with a small extension wire. Um, you can also get different spring rates that you can apply to it. Um, I haven't changed the spring, I've just got an extension and I find that works perfectly well for me. Um, but there's a number of ways that you can modify certain joysticks. Now what I would suggest personally um, is if you want to modify a joystick make sure you go to a reputable site so that you know what, what you're buying, uh, how to use it and all of the other things that go with it. Uh, I'm not necessarily on about this site, there are a number of companies that do these extensions and do similar things uh, but I'm not going to list them directly. The other thing to be aware of is there are joysticks that are much cheaper so although I've got a Thrustmaster Warthog uh, and I've got MFG pedals the combination of which is quite expensive, several hundred pounds uh, there are cheaper options out there and the, one of the options I used when I first started was this bad boy here, the T-Flight now it was done by another company, I can't remember what it was before Thrustmaster took it over and I had it many years ago and it came with one key element of it that is essential. For any helicopter flying in uh, simulated flight, you have to have a high degree of control over the tail rotor, over yaw. Because the aircraft are inherently unstable, uh, they will want to spin around their vertical axis uh, in one direction or the other, depending on a, a number of factors, and you have to be able to control that. And obviously, in addition, what you don't want is you don't want uh, a sort of... Um, step systems. You don't want to be pressing it with a button that's on off, on off, on off. You want to have uh, analog movement. So all three controls that you are going to need to use need to have analog movement. There is a fourth control for the throttle, uh, not necessarily needed for analog movement in most helicopters because most helicopters uh, have governor systems in them that allow you to set the throttle and leave it for the duration of the flight. Now this was the first um, control system I used. I'll click onto it and see if the images can support me with what I'm looking at here. This is a rocker switch and it's actually analog. So it's not digital, it's not on off on off. Uh, it's actually analog. Um, or it certainly was when I used this bad boy. And consequently it allowed you to use uh, analog inputs for the tail rotor left and right which made it much easier. Now other joysticks will offer the option of a twist grip and I know there's quite a few people use that. I couldn't get on with that, I'll be honest. Um, but one of the key things is this is a, uh, for me, a usable system uh, that is only £74, I think it is, £75, whatever it is. So, worth doing a bit of research. This isn't the only thing you can do and it isn't the only option. There are a number of options out there. Not That's not the purpose of this video. Uh, but it's just to say that, you know, you don't need to go to massive expense in order to have a decent set of controls for a helicopter. What you will need is the analog axes of uh, a joystick, so forwards, backwards, left, right. You'll need analog axis for the collective, so up and down, and you'll need an analog uh, input for the anti-torque pedals, or the, what you would refer to in an aircraft, fixed-wing aircraft, as rudder. So without further ado, let's have a look at the bits of the helicopter we need to mess around with. Okay, there's a cool tool I'm going to show you in a little bit, but fundamentally let's go through some very basic elements of the aircraft. Obviously it has a spinning rotor system on top, that's generating lift, very similar to the fixed wing... Uh, wing? For one to, okay, the, the wings of a fixed wing plane are effectively being pushed forwards through the air, and the airflow over them generates the lift. These are basically four spinning wings, uh, and as a result of which they will generate lift. Now, obviously, the advantage is because they don't need pushing forwards through the air, they can spin. That means you can hover, you can go vertically, and, and you can uh, mess around in that realm. However, obviously, the flip side is there are disadvantages because this is basically a massive gyroscope. Uh, it also has an issue with something called yaw, or better described as torque. So let's go up here and we'll, uh, we'll demonstrate what we mean or, or explain what we mean. The helicopter rotor blades here are spinning in a, it's very difficult to see the mouse, but they're spinning in a clockwise direction, uh, sorry, anti-clockwise direction as we view them from above. Doesn't look like it with the strobing effect, 
but they are turning in an anti-clockwise direction. Now on the ground that's not a problem, there is a force being applied against that, but as Newton would say every force has an equal and opposite reaction and when you lift off and you no longer have the friction of the skids on the ground, your engine is trying to turn this set of blades in an anti-clockwise direction. When you no longer have the friction of being sat on the ground and you're in the free medium of air, there's nothing to stop Newton's laws of motion from taking full effect. And what that means is whilst your blades will try to turn anti-clockwise, they will then induce a force on the fuselage which will try and turn the fuselage to the right, to the clockwise direction. And if unchecked, that would be a really, really impressive spinning display of the fuselage going one way and the rotor blades going the other. So what we have is we have this dinky little thing at the back, the tail rotor, and that is something we can use to balance out that uh, reaction. So what we have is an engine which is trying to turn the rotor blades, and when the rotor blades are turning, if we've got nothing else to stop it, the fuselage will turn in an opposite direction, uh, which in this case is nose to the right. Uh, viewed from above it is clockwise. Now obviously that then means that we come across an issue where the controls we want them to do one particular task so for example with a collector we want to uh, collectively increase the pitch of all the blades so that we lift off the ground. Great. As we do that there is an issue. If that was all it did that would be absolutely awesome and marvellous and fantastic. However what it does is if you imagine this at the moment has the collective fully down. I can lift the collective and you'll see that the blades do change pitch. Now when they increase pitch in order to climb and increase the lift off the rotor disc, what then happens is that it has drag, it increases drag, just the same as a fixed wing aircraft. If you increase the angle of attack of a, of a wing of an aircraft, we are basically increasing the angle of attack of, uh, of the rotor blades, which increases drag. When you increase drag, it changes this torque reaction. So you're making more demands and the rotor blades will try and slow down because they have the drag. Uh, you don't want the rotor blades to slow down, you want them at a steady speed, so you have to increase the throttle. When you increase the engine power, the amount of engine power that you're um, producing and delivering to the rotor blade, that changes how much torque there is in terms of the reaction from the fuselage compared to the wings, i.e. the rotor blade. Now it's very difficult to explain in just words alone, so what we will do is we will do a number of demonstrations to demonstrate what I'm talking about, because at the moment uh, it's a little, by, little bit like uh, talking about quantum physics in some respects. So the best way to go about this is demonstrations. The whole point of this video is not to go into um, pure aerodynamics and there are an awful lot of elements of helicopter flying that uh, are, are very complex to, to get your mind around. Um, some bits are fairly simple, some bits are fairly complex, others would, would blow my mind completely and I just don't even bother touching it. Um, but there's some fascinating things in it. As a realm, the aerodynamics of helicopters are a fascinating world, uh, but one that's very complex. So what we'll do is we're going to use a little tool uh, within um, x -Plane, and what we'll do is demonstrate a few elements of basics of the controls. Then we will do a couple of bits in terms of showing, if you like, the simplistic elements of the controls, and then we'll bring in uh, the elements where there's the unwanted or undesired effects of controls um, and then you know we'll, we'll demonstrate all of that. So without further ado let's have a quick look at uh, one of the natty tools within X-Plane. Now what I can do is if I press Control M I can cycle into it won't be completely obvious there we go that's what we're after and I'm gonna just change the time so that we can see this a little bit better Okay, so I don't quite understand the uh, the element of x -Plane in terms of what this is describing. The instructions aren't particularly great. I'm sure if I went into x -Plane Developer Forum it would uh, be much better. But it does help us demonstrate the, the basics of the controls. So at the moment you can see the tail rotor is in a pretty neutral position. You can see that this, if we consider this, I think this is actually the forces acting on the blades. But if we consider this as um, demonstrating the lift or the behaviour of um, the controls, and I'm specific about the controls, not necessarily the aerofoils, but the controls, 
uh, we will be able to demonstrate it. So with the collective, if I lift the collective, you'll see that all of these yellowy green lines go up. And they go up collectively. They all go up, you can see, by the same amount. It doesn't matter what I do with the control. They go up and down consistently across the disc. And this is referred to as a rotive disc, by the way. Um, you can see that all of the rotor disc is increasing or decreasing by the same amount. Now obviously in terms of the blades, the blades are all changing pitch, changing the angle of attack against the airflow and they're generating different forces. But with regards to all we need to worry about, if I change the collective, all of the forces change consistently across the rotor disc. Okay, so that's the collective. The cyclic, the stick between your knees, that's what you use to go forwards, backwards, left and right. And if I demonstrate the following, it becomes quite apparent. So turning to the left, you can see the rotor disc completely tilts to the left. At the moment, I'm not reliant on these yellow lines to tell me what the lift is doing, but all we need to do is just use this as a tool to visualise the left and right tilting of the rotor disc. So you can see right, left, and that's what our controls are doing. And likewise, if we come down here, you can see that forward tilts it forward, backwards tilts it backwards, and so on. So that's the first two controls. You've got the cyclic, which moves the disc in terms of a particular direction for the disc. And what it does actually is it increases the lift on one side, decreases the lift on the other side uh, as an overall and then you know you get the, the change in disc position but fundamentally all we really need to worry about is the fact that we are changing the position of the rotor disc by using the cyclic whether we want it to tilt to the left, the right, forwards or backwards. If we want to go um, to back to the collective, the collective changes all of the disc in terms of how much lift it's generating. The final thing at the back is the tail rotor. Now we haven't spoken about the tail rotor. The tail rotor is used to yaw the nose left and right and we use the anti-torque pedals which are what they're correctly named as in the aircraft. And what we can do, for example, we can use these little yellow lines to demonstrate that's left and that's right. Now I'm turning the nose to the left which means the force is pulling the tail to the right. And pulling the tail to the left if I want nose to the right. Now that's all fairly straightforward. Let's just pop inside. So, just looking at the controls, this is our collective. So, up is increasing collective, down is decreasing collective. This is our cyclic, so left, right, forwards, back, and then our anti torque pedals are down here. That's these pedals here, so right and left. Now, what I will point out at this uh, venture is the control inputs you need for a helicopter are far smaller than you would expect. You don't need huge inputs with a control uh, sort of stick and cyclic in terms of how much you need to put in to control the helicopter. Uh, in certain flight in areas of the envelope you will be able to use um, full controls. However, one of the things I would say with a helicopter is a common problem is over controlling so what happens is you put a control input in it goes a bit further than you want it and you pull back and then you go and, and you increase and eventually you're fighting the thing and it's all over the place we try to uh, reduce the amount of control inputs we put in we try to uh, fly in a controlled and sensitive manner and one of the things that I'll go through is using the trim system uh, on the Bell 407 uh, to help us do that now most helicopters have some sort of trim system, it depends on the helicopter, um, certainly when I was flying the R22 it didn't have any sort of uh, trim system from what I recall. Uh, the most useful thing it had was a governor to match engine speed to, or to maintain the engine speed when you were using the collective. The S300 however, um, that had a trim system if I recall correctly, but it had a correlator instead of a governor for the uh, controlling the engine. So. You know, all of these things are variables within each individual model and it's worth learning the model of aircraft. Now, we need to just briefly mention the fact that we have different gauges to a fixed wing aircraft. We discussed the fact that we've got a, uh, a rotor system. Now the rotor system, we need to monitor the speed of the rotor system. If the rotor system goes too slow, we lose the rigidity of the blades. The blades are kept rigid by the fact they're spinning very fast. Uh, it produces a, the, centri 
the centrifugal reaction or the centripetal force will allow the blades to be to remain rigid despite the lifting forces that are on them and the forces on the blades can be really quite high if you ever get a chance to watch a video on YouTube there's videos on YouTube where they've put a camera on the hub uh, the rotor hub of the uh, of the helicopter and it follows one blade and if you see the amount of flexing and bending they go through it's a truly terrifying thing to see because they bend and twist and flex and they go into lead and drag and it, it's all over the place it's it's awful to watch um, to see what happens to those blades so they they have a really tough time compared to a fixed wing uh, aircraft but as I say, what we need to do is we need to monitor the, the speed of the rotor disc, the, the rate of rotation. Anything that's rotating in an aircraft and a gauge will have an N uh, prefix to it. So in this case, you can see we've got NR, NP, NG. Uh, these are all Ns, which shows we've got a rotational speed. So the NG is the percentage of RPM for the gas generator part of the engine. And because it's a, uh, a basically a jet engine, it's called a free power turbine. I did a video on free power turbines for turbine engines many, many moons ago. But basically this is not directly connected to the rotor blade system. This is basically a gas producer, a jet engine that produces a hot uh, stream of gas, as a result of which that gas goes through a free power turbine, which is represented here with the NP. That turbine turns at a consistent speed and then consequently that is uh, linked to the rotor system by what's called a sprag clutch and that uh, turns the rotor system. And you can see there's green arcs for what's acceptable uh, range for the rotor system and what's an acceptable range for the free power turbine and also what's acceptable for uh, the engine RPM for the gas generator. Now there is another gauge that you'll find in a helicopter that you won't find in a fixed wing uh, aircraft. Uh, well, actually, I'll correct that. You will find it in turboprop aircraft, uh, but it's the torque gauge. This is basically an indication of how much physical power is being put through the whole system. And as a helicopter, you will have a number of red line limits. You'll have a limit for the NG, limit for the NR, limit for the MP, and here you've got a limit for the torque. Now, the torque is best described by, you know, in my mind, as this is how much power you're or strain you're putting on the system, the whole. Air engine and gearbox and, and the whole system that you're using to, to deliver your lift. So this is really quite important and, and a lot of the time this will be something that you refer to. Now what I will add here is I am not a professional or expert helicopter pilot so during this there's every chance that while I, I will exceed the torque limits. But at the end of the day this is a simulation and no one's going to die. If I was doing this for real then it would be a whole different ball game. Likewise I haven't learnt the flight profiles for a Bell 407 so there's every chance I'm going to go into an area called the avoid curve. The avoid curve is an area of the flight regime where it is dangerous to be because you wouldn't be able to uh, safely recover the aircraft after an engine failure. So for example you'd be too slow uh, and too high or too high too slow whatever combination it is to be able to safely conduct an auto rotation and therefore you're in real trouble if the engine quits but that's well beyond what we're going to talk about here really all we need to worry about is the fact that when we increase the power demands on the engine the torque goes up as you can see gradually here I'm not going to increase the collective too much torque goes up these two you want to stay the same at, uh, at a reasonable level, that tells you that all the performance uh, controls in terms of the rotor system are working correctly and you'll see that the NG increases because we're putting more demand through the system and then it will stabilise about 80 again. But that again is a, an area where it does vary depending on what you're doing in terms of control inputs. So that's the basics of the engine instruments. So we've got the engine instruments, we've got the basics of what the controls do, left, right, forwards, back, up, down, etc. Swiveling left and right, um, to use the non-technical terms. Uh, what we now need to discuss is what each control is used for. Now obviously one of the things we said was that the collective is used for going up and down basically because it collectively increases the pitch on all of the rotor blades at the same time and collectively lifts the disc. Uh, in its current format, you know, whatever uh, position it's in, it will pull the whole disc in that direction consistently across the disc. This will move it around and down here you've got the throttle, which I've got mapped to an axis, but you don't need it mapped to an axis. There's the uh, low RPM warning. You can see as we've gone down here, low RPM, because we've 
backed off the throttle so we've got less engine power to drive the rotor system hence why the NR and MP is dropping and you'll see that the NR and MP is dropping even though we've got a consistent gas flow output so we're only outputting 63.7 percent of our gas flow uh, our maximum being uh, actually over 100 percent so the red line is in above 100 percent don't quite know what the exact reading is it looks like 105 there but you can see that we've got no direct link between the two systems so what I can do is I can power up and take the power off and this thing's got inertia there's a slight lag between this system and my input so this has got no lag or no perceivable lag as I move the controls so off on off on but you can see this has got a lag so off on and it's got a couple of seconds or a second or so before it responds to it and we want it to go all the way back up to where we can use it for flight so just bear in mind that um, one of the elements we need to try and do is, is reduce uh, potential for inputting lag into the control of the aircraft and there's another couple of ways that we can uh, uh, induce lag um, depending on you know how we're flying the aircraft which is why I stress we need to try and fly with small corrections smoothly uh, big corrections are not going to help us at all so let's get a bit, a bit more light back in the uh, in the world and we'll uh, take it from there right so here we are back in the world and I'm just going to set my view now one of the things that you've got an opportunity to do with helicopters um, and with most aircraft to be honest is you can introduce head tracking VR and you can just leave it as it is I'll be honest for helicopters I found that VR and head tracking can create more problems in the early days than they solve. Uh, the reason being is that in this current format with this fixed screen the only thing that's going to move, my head's not going to move, the panel's not going to move which is my reference or my framework for using the helicopter and likewise the outside world is going to move. So I only have one of three variables moving. As soon as you start to put head tracking in uh, you can move your head which is the first variable for movement which will give you a different image second thing that will move is the panel so the panel will move around and the ground will move around so trying to coordinate panel ground and your own head movement can be quite um, quite a, a, a difficult task in the early days it gets better this particular aircraft is very nice in VR really enjoy flying it in VR uh, I just need more practice in it and to be fair for helicopters everything in helicopters is about practice so what we're going to do is we're going to lift into the hover and we're going to demonstrate some of our controls and we're going to demonstrate the perfect world controls to start with and then what actually happens in the real world so let's just bring ourselves forwards a little bit we also need to demonstrate the trim system on this helicopter so let's bring ourselves around here and then we'll demonstrate the basics of the controls and then we'll demonstrate the basics of the trim system because that's going to be essential for this helicopter really now this helicopter does have SAS stability augmentation system a lot of helicopters do by default let me just get myself into a steady hover right and let's just settle her down again so I can talk so a lot of helicopters do have stability augmentation this is one such helicopter so if I come down here here's your SAS system, your stability augmentation system and once it's in it's basically similar to an autopilot uh, it gives you additional stability to the uh, handling of the aircraft uh, heading, nav, back course, alt and vertical speed controls the same as you'd have in most autopilots I'll be honest this aircraft is fairly stable and therefore I don't use it at all um, I fly um, purely by hand and if you set up the trim system then the trim system makes it fairly easy to use so I'll just change viewpoint uh, where is it here just so you can see the stick okay we need to discuss at this point the trim system now with fixed wing aircraft the trim system is there to relieve the loads uh, on you as the pilot so you're not having to constantly hold a control input in a particular position so you don't have to keep forcing the, the yoke forwards if the nose wants to rise just to maintain your attitude and it's exactly the same in helicopters bear in mind they have no uh, inherent stability the same as a fixed wing aircraft so if you disturb it from its fixed uh, position that it's in at the time it's potentially not going to return 
to that same position, the same as a fixed-wing aircraft generally would. I mean, there's a lot of fixed-wing aircraft that won't, so fighters inherently have a certain amount of instability built into them, so they have greater agility. But if we're talking about uh, general aviation aircraft, um, excluding aerobatic aircraft, because obviously they want the agility over the stability, um, then, you know, stability is great. For us, we don't have that option, but we do have additional aids such as uh, the trim system and SAS. Now, with the, an aircraft, obviously a normal aircraft in terms of fixed wing, the trim system is generally some sort of movable tabs aerodynamically affecting the, the, the aircraft as a whole. Now, in an airliner, you have uh, the tailplane section moves as a whole for trim uh, with the elevator on the trailing edge of it. Uh, in a general aviation aircraft, you have an elevator with a small trim tab on it that's manually controlled by the, the, the pilot. We don't have the ability to do that because the wings are spinning above us in the rotor blades. We have no ability to induce small control deflections in that using tabs on the rotor blades. So we have to have some other system and basically what happens is we have a system that will forcibly hold the controls in a certain position or inputs to the controls in a certain position. Now what do I mean by that? Well what that basically means is if, we'll just come down here a little bit, if in order to fly forward at a set speed I need my cyclic to be there, I don't want to be fighting against the system with my strength. Now actually, when I have my simulator controls, my Warthog uh, pushed forwards, I have to hold it there. If I let go, that happens, and that would be exactly the same in the helicopter in real life. It will want to return to its neutral force position, where it's, it's not got any force on the controls. Now obviously, if we're flying straight and level and we do that, the aircraft's going to rear nose up and we're going to go somewhere we didn't want but we do need to reduce the amount of force that's input. And as part of that, there's a trim release system or a trim system in the aircraft, um, which is this little button down here. And what you need to do is map two buttons. You need your force trim button mapped, and I map it to a similar button position to that on the Warthog. Um, and you also need a force trim release because uh, you need to be able to return the, the stick to a neutral position. So the best way to demonstrate this is at the moment my Thrustmaster is at the same position as the cyclic in the helicopter. We're going to fly forwards, I want the stick to be held in that position, but I don't want to be holding my Thrustmaster. So what I can do is I can press Force Trim, I can then return my Thrustmaster to its neutral position where the spring is not forcing the controls in any direction, release the button and there we go. So now what we've established is a new, 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 new neutral position for this control. If I look at my Warthog, um, it's now in its neutral position where the spring is, you know, I've let go of it, the spring is doing nothing. Um, but now what I have is I have a really fine level of control around the center point of the Warthog, but this has got a new displaced position. I can release the trim, the, uh, the control of the trim, so it's force trim release, press that button, and that returns to its neutral position. So the best way to think of this is, what you're doing is you're saying, for that flight, be it hovering or be it forward flight or to whatever it is, um, you have a position that you want that stick to, in effect, be the neutral position so that you can make your tiny or small corrections around that position. You don't want to be forcibly holding it there. However, in the real world, I'm having to forcibly hold my joystick in that position. So what I can do, the same as the pilot in the real thing would do, is use the force trim system. Now in terms of the force trim system, all they've got to do is press and release the button and it just holds it there. They don't do, need to do what we need to do, because we've got a spring in our joystick that automatically wants it to return to a central position, which if we were to let go does that, not what we want. We want that control to stay in that position, so press force trim, hold it, release the pressure on your joystick so it goes back to its central neutral position and then release the button and you'll notice that that cyclic stick did not move in the sim so it's retained its position, its memory for want of a better way of describing it of where its new neutral position is and my joystick at home has moved back into its neutral position so there's no spring force, I can let go of it as I have done this isn't moving, my joystick isn't moving and whatever position I'd left it in in the control system in the aircraft it is now doing. So, if I then wanted to do it I can press force, force trim release but what it means is I can have 
take the vast majority of the strain out of having to control this by holding it in one position. So now my joystick is in a neutral position and I can make the fine inputs I might need for hovering, etc. Force trim release, the two match up again. And that's the best way of describing it, is I want the, the joystick to match the cyclic stick in the game. So I want my joystick in the real world to match the cyclic in the, in the game. Now, what we need to do then is just very briefly have a look at the if you like, the desired effects of the controls that we would expect. So, first thing we're going to do is lift into a hover. I'm going to have to just set myself up with a balanced hover first. Because I don't want to be moving all over the place while I'm doing it. Let's use my force trim to try and... Once you've used your force trim, you can use the trim buttons if you want to trim your aircraft so that you're not drifting forwards backwards. That's a relatively decent hover for what we're doing. Actually, just trim it back a little bit. There we go. And you'll see that if I go to this view, you'll see that I'm having to put in lots of tiny little corrections just as we're drifting around. Now, an important point to remember is this is like being a uh, ice hockey puck on ice. It will inherently want to drift in one direction or the other. Once it starts, it's got uh, momentum and it will keep drifting in that direction until you put correction in. So if I go left, for example, let go of the stick, it will still drift to the left until I put a correcting input to the right. So just remember, you're like a hockey puck on ice. You have to continually put in the little inputs to keep your position and hover where you are. So, I'm going to do what's called co coordinated inputs, just so we can see what, if you like, the primary desire for each control is. So collectively, we're going to increase the collective and see what happens. We go up, reduce the collective, we go down increase the collective, we go up. My hover is going all over the place, I'll explain why it's doing so, and we go down. So that's collectively, we're collectively changing the angle of pitch of the rotor blade. All of the blades are increasing their pitch simultaneously as a result of which we go up or down. Next bit is the cyclic. The cyclic, if you remember from our demonstration with the lines, tilts the disc forwards, backwards, left or right. So if I tilt it forwards and hold it there, we move forwards, if I tilt it back and hold it there, we'll firstly slow down because we're our hockey puck and then we'll go backwards. And if you remember what we need to do is we need to put in some sort of correcting force to stop the aircraft where we want it. Same for left and right, so if I do left and right, and don't forget we need our correcting influence to stop it in the position we want, we are drifting a little bit backwards there. Okay, so I did that as, co as uh, coordinated inputs, so it looked very straightforward, up, down, left, right, not quite so easy. We do have this bad boy here, the tail rotor. Now if you remember I said that there's a, a force in terms of when we're off the ground, the rotors turn one way, but the reaction is they want to turn the fuselage the other way. I'm drifting all over the place, this is really bad, but I'm trying to talk whilst hovering. Um, so if you remember we have anti-torque pedals. Now, obviously, one of the things that's happening is in order to control that torque and have the fuselage pointing forwards whilst we're maintaining our position poorly, one of the things it's doing is it's using the engine power to counteract, it's using uh, the anti-torque pedals uh, with the engine power being used on them to counteract the torque. If you imagine the rotor system is turning one way and the fuselage is trying to turn the other, so we're having to use the pedals to hold it steady. What that means is we have more pedal authority in one direction in the hover than the other. I'll just quickly demonstrate that. That's a left turn, max rate left turn, not particularly fast. Max rate right turn, considerably faster. And that's because we're using up a certain amount of our power just to keep the fuselage straight. We're straining against the high power input in the engines and the rotors. Okay, now I'm just going to land a moment just to give myself a bit of a breather here. A bit of a bumpy one, but never mind. Now, we described earlier the interrelationship between controls, and there is a, a, an interrelationship that's fairly uh, important to be aware of. So let's just pop outside to talk about this. We've still got our lines on, so it's going to help us visualise it. At the moment, when we hover, we have a vector of a certain length which is demonstrating or showing our lift vertically upwards when we're hovering. And let's say it's 10 units, I don't know, 10 bananas in length, 10 bananas in strength is enough to keep us hovering. When we 
move the disc forwards to start accelerating forwards and to fly forwards. This 10 banana force is now tilted forwards, it's pointing forwards. And if we look at the length of that line, we ha unless we change something with the collective, it's still going to be 10 bananas long. What that then means is that because we've tilted it forwards, not all of it is going to be our lift. Not all of it is going to be pulling us upwards away from the ground. A certain proportion of it will now be pushed forwards, which is what's going to accelerate us forwards. Accelerating forwards to fly forwards, good, we like that. Only having eight bananas of lift left when our helicopter weighs ten bananas means we're going to go down. Not good. So what that then means is in order to fly forwards we need to increase our collective. So we would then potentially increase our collective look. What that means is the big arrow would get longer in this direction. That means that the two component parts of it, the vertical bit, would go back from eight bananas to ten bananas and the forwards bit would potentially then go from two bananas to maybe three bananas. But fundamentally what we're doing is every time we displace the disc from its hover position or its given position that it's in at the time we will then have to change the amount of thrust that the disc as a whole is generating. That is the first problem you have. So every time we displace the cyclic we potentially have to change the amount of collective we put in. Okay, so as a result of having to change the amount of collective that we put in, we're changing the angle of the discs or the, the blades on the disc, which will make more or less demand of the engine in terms of torque. So the torque will increase or decrease in terms of the power you're putting through the system. What that means is we have to have more or less engine power being delivered. More or less engine power means that this system we talked about where we've got the uh, anti-clockwise spinning rotor blades and the clockwise tendency for the fuselage to turn, because we've got more engine power going through the system, that torque balance changes. That means we then need to use the tail rotor. I can quite readily demonstrate this by doing the following. Let's get ourselves into the hover, or a vague attempt at a hover. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop coordinating the inputs. I'm going to have a look at what happens if the controls were not coordinated. So this is what happens if it's not coordinated. I'm going to increase the collective. Now if you remember what we said was when we increase the collective it's going to make the, the fuselage want to turn to the right. So let's do it. Increase the collective, there it goes. We go up, but we also go right. Go down, we go left. Go up, we turn right. Go down, we turn left. Let's get ourselves back into some form of controlled hover rather than uh, going up and down like we're doing some sort of crazed press-ups. So there we go. What we now need to do is you now need to go... We'll just also mention... Trim this out so I can take my hand off the controls a little bit briefly so I can use the mouse. Drifting backwards, so let's just trim forward a little bit. Okay, if you pay attention here, you'll also notice our gas generator increases and our torque increases as we mess around. So down we go, up we go. There we go, and they're demonstrating the amount of strain going through the system in terms of the torque and the amount of engine power that's being delivered to the system through the NG. You'll notice that the NP and the NR remain pretty much the same due to the fact that they are basically governed to maintain that speed. So let's get ourselves back to some sort of random hover. Now, what that also means is that if you start to use engine power to turn the tail left and right, turn the nose left and right, you also affect the amount of lift you have because instead of that engine power being delivered to the rotors, it's now being delivered to the tail rotor, which means your anti-torque pedals also will change the amount of lift you generate. Very difficult to see, it's not really showing on either the visuals or on the tail rotor, or well, sorry, or on the... Uh, or on the instruments, but uh, I think you'll have to just take my word for it. Although it's very difficult to see and to visualise, it is happening. 
Now the main thing out of all of this means that every time you change either the cyclic or mainly the collective, you're going to have to put some input into the anti-torque pedals. Um, it's just the way it is with a helicopter. It's a coordinated thing that every time you change one variable, be it cyclic, collective or tail rotor, you have to just nudge the others to maintain a stable state in that system uh, in terms of having coordinated flight. And the main one really is when you change the collective, you're changing these, you have to change not really the cyclic. You may have to change the cyclic because if the lift vector from the or the vector of thrust from the rotor disc isn't directly up, then potentially you have to change the cyclic to maintain speed or, or whatever it may be. But they're all interrelated, so it's all just a big juggling match, which is why I suggest that without your control, you cannot really fly a helicopter simulator. Um, and it, it, it's one of the things with FSX P3D, they have an auto coordination option, uh, in, which is great for fixed wing if you don't have rudder input. Uh, absolutely naff for helicopters, really, really, just it doesn't work. So turn that off, in my opinion. Likewise, you can see you don't need SAS to, to fly this thing accurately, you can just use fingertip pressure once you've got it trimmed out. And you trim it out as we described earlier. Uh, now, what we're going to do is demonstrate the trim, so we're going to go forwards into forwards flight, nose over, slight increase in collective, we're not going to discuss translational lift which we've just burbled our way through there, um, and other more advanced aerodynamic features of the helicopter, we're just going to start to accelerate away. And I have to be careful with the torque, because the torque varies depending on your tail rotor input. Now, let's just pause there and have a look outside. Now, you can see the rotor disc is tilted forwards because we're flying forwards. However, one of the things we've now got to consider is that this vertical surface here now has airflow going over it. So it's got airflow going from front to back. Now, if you were to look at it closely enough from above, you would see that it's actually shaped as an aerofoil, which means it has a lift component or a force component that is generated by the surface, which is designed that in forwards flight it helps counteract the torque effect of the rotor blade and engine and fuselage, all of that blah that we talked about earlier. What it means is that you then potentially can reduce your rotor, uh, your force input from the tail rotor, means you need less pedal. So in order to, uh, to counter that you potentially have to change your pedal, foot pedal positions, well you will have to change your foot pedal positions to adjust accordingly. Now just uh, to be aware there are different configurations of these tail rotors. Some are designed to push, some are designed to pull. Um, it, it depends on the developer, the model. Uh, also things like fenestrons where they're fully enclosed are slightly different to this. Uh, and I haven't done a great deal with fenestrons so I don't really know a fat lot about them other than they basically do the same thing. However, there is an issue where you can get things like loss of tail rotor control where your tail rotor is insufficiently powerful in whatever direction it is you're turning uh, to counter the, the yawing effect from the main system. So there's all sorts of complications can arise and come into play. But we are now flying forwards, the disc is tilted forwards, we've got an aerodynamic airflow going over the tail so we can actually get away with reducing our input for our tail slightly. So let's go back into the cockpit. Um, what I haven't mentioned at this point is I've actually force trimmed the controls again so let's, uh, let's get back into a position try and force trim our controls out so that we're flying forwards and we're going to turn around and come back in towards the island. One of the things I do love about X-Plane 11 is the way that uh, the camera shifts as you turn. Really, really nice effect. Really nice. Not quite uh, balanced with the ball in the middle. Can put a little bit more yaw in. where we've taken off from. So we're going to fly back over the top of it, over towards the other island and you'll see why in a moment. So in terms of controlling helicopters, they're controlled or the, the aim is to control them slightly different to how you would control a fixed wing aircraft. So a fixed wing aircraft, push the nose down, accelerates and goes down, pull the nose back, it slows down and goes up. Likewise your throttles, your, your, your let's rock throttle, uh, push it forwards, the engine produces more power, you go faster, pull it back, you go slower. However there's an interrelationship, um, which is why when you're landing a fixed wing aircraft they will say that throttle controls your rate of descent and pitch controls your speed. Um, 
not quite the same, but in a helicopter, your cyclic, by forwards and backwards, is your speed control. Your collective, up and down, is to control your rate of climb or descent. And as a result, you have to coordinate those two. And obviously, every time you make a change to your collective, because you want to change your rate of descent, you have to make a change to your pedals. So you can see where the implications are in terms of controlling helicopters. What I'm going to do is bring us around to the slight right and slow us down quite considerably. Uh, and I'm slowing us down by pitching back on the rotor disc to see if I can find what I'm looking for. There it is. Now what you've got to be careful of is a thing called settling with power in a helicopter, also known as vortex ring state. Uh, we're not going to go into that, but basically if you imagine what you're doing is you're uh, not able to generate the same lift profile as you would want and therefore you run the risk of going into dirty air and you basically, it doesn't matter how much you increase the collective, you can't maintain a hover, you just keep descending. The more you increase the collective, the more you struggle with the hover. Now my trim is all over the place at the minute. And one of the things with helicopters is really you need to spend most of your time looking out the window. A, it's where the prettiest view is, and B, it's where your references are for virtually everything you're going to undertake. So every time I'm tweaking up my collective, I'm having to add a little bit of left pedal just to keep myself straight. Every time I'm messing around with my cyclic, I'm potentially having to move my collective just to maintain the position. So I've just force trimmed into that rough hover position. We'll take a look at where we're going to be going. We're going to be going into that landing pad there. Because I've force trimmed, I can now fly it using fingertips rather than brute force, uh, which means that I should be able to have some sort of passable landing attempt here. We're going to come over this first row of bushes because, in fact, we'll just hold it here. We'll survey our surroundings. So we've got buildings and tall trees to the right, so we don't really want to go too close to those. We do have area for the tail, though, if we're on the pad. We've got tall trees to the left, don't really want to go over those. If ground effect is modelled, this uh, line of cliffs is an issue to be aware of, but I don't think it's going to be that influential for us. And we don't want to go too far with our rotor disc because of the trees on the far side on the start of the hill. So we know that we're safe if we come over the uh, over these bushes straight at the helipad. So using plenty of visual references we can just come over slowly, slowly, slowly. And that's one of the things I would say is when you're in this phase of flight, careful considered controls are far better than absolutely manic controls, just got to be mindful of the bushes we're coming over. Probably a bit low for those, can't quite see them at the minute. And we're going to make a complete ham-fisted attempt of going into this area. Don't forget that we've got our ice hockey puck effect that we're going to skid around if we're not paying attention to it. We have to have our counter uh, countering control once we're sliding or skidding off to one side we have to then put a countering control to contain it gradually lowering the collective and there we go we're down so guys hopefully that's been of some useful input to you um, obviously feel free to, to comment like share and subscribe on the video and I look forward to speaking to speaking to you again soon take care